On today's World Insight, China and the European Union buckling down to a dialogue to thresh out differences and to work on common ground. Better prospects for climate action and global growth? And as China rolls out plans to achieve carbon neutrality, at the core of these efforts is the nation's biggest energy supplier, the State Grid Corporation. With power shortages in Northeast China, it's all the more crucial to hear details of the green transition, direct from the State Grid Chairman. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi co-chairs on Tuesday the 11th round of high-level strategic dialogue between China and the EU with Joseph Borrell, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. That's after Vice Premier Han Zheng stressed the consensus of deepening green cooperation in a previous meeting with European leaders via video link. China has taken another big and practical step in pushing for renewable power. At the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced that China will step up support for other developing countries in tapping into green and low-carbon energy and ruled out building new coal-fired power projects abroad. With these Chinese green initiatives, will it help steer the world economy towards a more sustainable and inclusive growth? How could China and the EU better collaborate in dealing with pressing global challenges? Our panelists spoke about that. For more on the latest interaction between China and the European Union in Brussels, Nicholas White, Senior Director of APCO's Brussels office. In Berlin, Ulrich Brugner, Jean Monet Professor for European Studies at Stanford University in Berlin. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you first. Well, a lot of things are going on in the world, and it seems that China and the EU want to talk to one another. That certainly is good news, isn't it, Mr. White? Oh, absolutely. Uh, dialogue is much better than conflict. Although, of course, one can have both dialogue and conflict uh, in different in different realms. But it's very clear that there is an agenda for cooperation mm. between China and the EU. Uh, it's also very clear that in an increasingly multipolar world, uh, China is an important and powerful entity, and the European Union is an important and powerful entity. And we're all better when these people are in a stage of structured communication yeah. uh, to identify common interests and common problems. According to the latest uh, readout from the interaction between the Chinese Foreign Minister, State Councilor Wang Yi, and his counterpart with the EU, the EU side has been talking about how a frame the China relationship. The yeah. EU officials suggest it is a matured, multifaceted, non-confrontational relationship in which close and smooth communications are needed. What are those adjectives yeah. mean to you, Mr. Bruckner? I think what it says is that we are not on a confrontational path. What we have seen two weeks ago, that the United States, Australia and the UK joined a strategic military oriented agreement. This is different from what the European Union tries to continue, which has always been multifaceted in the sense of we have so many common issues to discuss that it wouldn't help if we flex muscles or we show tools from hard power and we rather keep all the channels open for trust and multilateralism and everything it needs to address the challenges of the 21st century. Mm. What about that for you, Mr. White, all these adjectives? I think some of them are descriptive and some are aspirational. Um, it is true that this is a multifaceted relationship, but it's also somewhat limited. Um, China and the European Union have got very strong interests in common uh, business dealings, uh, building up uh, you know, joint 
uh, economic ventures. They've got a very, very strong interest in cooperation on climate change. Um, both the EU and China are very strong advocates for the need to adapt. They have areas of joint interest, but not necessarily cooperation in international development, particularly in terms of bringing uh, economic development to Africa. And that's an area where we have seen competition between the two. It is possible to imagine a more cooperative relationship. Mm. However, we mm. have also seen a certain amount of conflict. Um, we've seen a dispute between China and Lithuania, which may be a small European member state, but it's still a member state. And there's been a dispute between the two of them over the Taipei issue. Uh, and I think that is an indicator that uh, although Mr. Burrell, the EU chief diplomat, may say that he would like the relationship to be non-confrontational, that's not always the way it's going to be. Mm. People are asking, you know, generally speaking, the leadership of this generation, whether they are more transactional or they are more forward-looking. I think that's a question also needs to be asked to the European leaders, particularly uh, Mr. Buchner, with Angela Merkel, uh, one of the well-respected uh, uh, leaders in the EU, likely to leave the political uh, stage. Whether the others will be able to shoulder the responsibility, how they are going to perform about uh, the role of Europe rather than being anybody's follower. So, Mr. Buchner, how do you see that? I like the term likely to leave because we are still forming a coalition in Germany and nobody knows how long it's going to take until yeah. Merkel will finally have, have a chance to retire. But to be more serious, um, I think everyone who could potentially form a coalition in Germany, and I think that also counts for the other leaders in the European Union, are equally committed to multilateralism and to, I wouldn't say, a transactional definition of what our relationship is. It will always be a combination of values and principles and norm-based definitions of what are we want, what do we want and what do we stand for, and also what is in our mutual interest. And therefore, such dialogues are of utmost importance to understand what has changed and who represents what and where are the differences compared with, let's say, a year ago or the situation before the pandemic. If we don't understand what are the domestic constraints, both in China and in the European Union, yeah. we will make mistakes that we can avoid by keeping the communication channels open. Mm. Mr. White, what about that question for you? China is a very important world power. The EU is a very important world power. Mm -hmm. So in order to lead, there is no choice but to engage in dialogue. Now, the question is on what terms? And I thought you put it quite well in putting the dichotomy between being forward-looking or being transactional. There is no need that you cannot have both. I think that a forward-looking relationship necessarily is transactional as well. If, if we're looking at, for instance, the international development situation, that is, uh, that is a policy that by its very nature is forward-looking. It's about improving the economy in countries in the developing world so that they too will become rich and be, and be able to participate uh, as equals in the global economy. So it's forward-looking. But it's also very transactional because it's about building up links between the, uh, the, the donor community, the, the developed economies and those countries that are not yet in that category. Mr. Bruckner, let me also ask you about that. How, how do you see you know, European politics, particularly Europe as a whole, uh, used to present to the world of one with principle? And it is, it has been, in fact. Um, and it is, you know, the founder of the modern uh, political systems and many other things. So, Mr. Buchner, do you see the leaders together these days will be able to answer once again that historic question and that historic responsibilities? Well, to come back to the previous one, I think it helps if we don't call it transactional, but focus on the utilitarian side mm. of international relations. 
And if we ignore that there are interests and we have to respect the interest-driven motivation of doing something and believe that everything is perfectly driven by ideas and principles, then we miss the point. Mm. There's sometimes this bias in German foreign policy that we believe that multilateralism is an aim in itself and that it's not used as a tool by others to maximize their gains. So thinking that now the Trump years are over and the Biden administration is not interested in maximizing the interests for the United States would be utterly naive. And what we find in the European Union is a mishmash of different interests and why someone is a member of the European Union or why someone is supporting what Mr. Borrell is presenting as an EU-China strategy, there is still a widespread of different positions and it's extremely hard for him to mm. position himself and to define something like the long-term goals of the European Union in that mm. respect. For one more perspective, I'm joined also by Mr. Wang Yiwei, Jean Monnet Chair, Professor and Director of the Center for EU Studies with Renmin University of China. Professor Wang, your take. Well, in the eyes of the Chinese, uh, European Union represents a new kind of modern civilization of the human being, uh, not just on the base of Asian European civilization. So we identify the China-EU relations of the two kinds of the civilizations relationship. Uh, secondly, uh, European Union definitely is a uh, uh, major uh, driving force of globalization. So it's a market, uh, it's a technology, innovation, it's a, a normative power. So China, you uh, take a leading role, like uh, in a climate change, uh, multilateralism. And thirdly, uh, European Union also is a, a geopolitical player in the international uh, society. So China, you can cooperate in the uh, uh, Iranian nuclear uh, negotiation and uh, many other hot top. Uh, so China and the EU relations, I think, uh, uh, is, uh, have uh, uh, go beyond of the China-US confrontation have the independent uh, of, the, of the approach. Very interesting. The last sentence, particularly Professor Wang, when you said it is China's approach to the EU is independent from uh, the latest realities of China-US relationship. Uh, Mr. White, you respond? Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, the relationship is very different. Um, the US and China have got potential security conflicts of interest. Um, let's be really frank about that. There are discussions about, you know, you've already mentioned the Taiwan question. Uh, there's the question of the, uh, the, the South China Sea. Um, these are live issues for the United States and they're not live issues for Europe. So the security element is going to be largely absent from the China-EU dialogue and um, present to a much greater degree in China's approach to the United States. Um, the business side of things, I think, also plays out a bit differently because Europe is committed to a more open economy um, with a certain amount of hesitation, but still it's committed to a more open economy. Mm -hmm. And the United States is heading in a more protectionist direction. Mm. Mr. Brugner. Well, even if we have all the reasons to discuss things from strictly the point of view of what are China's positions and interests and what a European Union wants, it's not independent from what is happening on the other side of the Atlantic. And in times in which the position of the United States, even after Trump, is more confrontational with China, we as partners in NATO and we as part of the Western world will be pushed to sideline with the United States and form a more pro-American position that affects the relationship between the European Union and China. And this is something not all political leaders in the European Union are happy with, but it will be the new reality that we have to deliver if partnership is more than a word. Mm. But Mr. Buchner, one crucial thing is whether the EU is believing that you always go with the precedence or the EU needs to understand that there is a newer reality, somewhat at least, that is still brewing. Nobody knows where things are, uh, in fact, at this point. 
So how will the EU, will that be able to just to seek the earlier practice, which is mainly to be standing together with the United States on what the U.S. believes as crucial issues? Or uh, the EU is going to have a palatable uh, relationship that will, with EU's core interest uh, in mind, even though it is still very hard as things are moving on to figure out what exactly are the core interests of the EU. Mr. Buchner. Well, if the European Union would be a king and you asked this, uh, would be a kingdom <laughs> and you ask the king, how do you form the position in <laughs> the situation that you just described? It would be a hard nut to crack. But coming back to what we discussed earlier about the domestic constraints of an organization of 27 different publics. At this given point, when we have Macron lobbying for a stronger European security position that can also be used to form an independent position independently from what the United States would like to see happening, we simply don't know in what direction we are moving. The German election campaign almost avoided a position on what is the stance of the different candidates who could become the successor of Merkel to form an opinion towards China, towards the future of NATO or a strategic autonomy of the European Union. Mm. And if we don't even know what the German position is, how can I read in my crystal ball what the future <laughs> position of the European Union will mm -hmm. be? Well, Mr. Buchner is having a difficult time reading the current uh, crystal ball he has on hand. What about for you, Professor Wang? Do you have another ball? In the eyes of the Chinese, uh, European Union is different with the United States. Firstly, the United States uh, is a hegemonic power, uh, which has, uh, like Taiwan, South China Sea, direct confrontation with China. Uh, European Union, there's no any geopolitics confrontation with China. Mm. Uh, no historic uh, remain questions. Uh, secondly, the United States, uh, of course, is different with the uh, uh, European Union, which has a, a military alliance system. So um, in Australia, you know, the Philippines and uh, Japan and, and South Korea, all these that China has to face up with. Mm -hmm. The European Union is uh, not that case. There are a lot of uh, grand issues that we have discussed, but I have to focus also on some of the specific ones because they could tell the story to a certain extent. For example, climate change one of the common themes between China and the EU. How is it going to be uh, leveraged by both sides for a better cooperation relationship while at the same time be able to help their domestic agenda uh, for energy transition? That's an interesting issue. Another interesting issue about things like Afghanistan or Iran, these hot button issues. How will both sides work with one another? Will they be able to fulfill uh, the vacuum that the Americans have left with, one could arguably speak uh, that it is a bigger hole now uh, over there uh, than when they came in to Afghanistan, for example. And another thing is, how about the other issues that the world is facing right now uh, that the Americans with um, their own domestic politics, very busy, uh, are hardly hardly could have the energy and the willingness to deal with. What about China and the EU? Uh, so uh, on these three areas, uh, gentlemen, which do you think that China and the EU will be able to more constructively work, work on? One, climate change. Two, hot button issues. Third, issues that the US do not even have the willingness to care uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, would you choose one, two, or three? Uh, uh, Mr. White, your choice. Oh, climate change all the way. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, Mr. Bruckner, your choice. I think all three are too important to just focus our energy on just one. So you're saying, Mr. Bruckner, all of the above, one, two, and three. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All of the above. <laughs> Professor Wang, what about your choice? Uh, two. Uh, firstly, it's about uh, low carbon neutrality. Okay. Second, it's about digital digital partnership. Okay. Well, everyone has your reasons, so please explain. Uh, Mr. White, you chose one. Sure. I mean, you know, climate change is an existential issue that threatens the future of the human race on this planet. 
and no serious politician, I mean, there are, there are plenty of unserious politicians, but no serious politician can afford to ignore the challenge. Um, and it's, it, from my view, both the EU and China have made some very positive statements on this in the last few few weeks, few days, even at the UN General Assembly. We have the, the big climate conference coming up very shortly in Scotland. That's going to be a real turning point to show whether the world is serious about tackling this challenge. Um, it looks to me like both China and the EU will be sending the right, the, the right signals. Okay. If I can speak about the other two questions you raised. Afghanistan is Afghanistan. It's its own problem. It's a neighbor of China. So China, of course, is going to be very interested in what happens there. It's not a neighbor of Europe. And provided that the internal affairs of Afghanistan do not uh, disturb okay. what is happening in Europe, it will be left alone. All right. Professor Wang? Well, low carbon because uh, it's a, a post-industrial civilization. Uh, European Union take a leading role. However, China is a very dynamic and a strong uh, Cooperator and uh, competitor with the uh, European Union. China's market is so large, and China is a transform uh, from the high standard to uh, to match the local condition of the developing countries. Mm. Uh, China is a world factory, so the key to, to uh, solve this problem. And the second, digital. China, we have Baidu, our uh, own search engine, so we're independent. I just come back from Wuzhen World Internet Conference. So this uh, transition from the uh, industrial civilization to the digital civilization. European Union need uh, to work together with China to have their own search engine. Uh, they can have the AI and, the, uh, and also a digital economy. Professor Bruckner, you heard your partners. So your thoughts, you, saw, you chose one, two, three, and all of the above. Well, the reason why I answered like this is that it's not just a question of what is the most important problem and do we have to force attention to just one. It's also a matter of perception. And China has been very successful in nation branding, whether it's likable or whether it appears as a potential rival, which is also part of the communication strategies within countries, like look at the Trump administration, how it turned China into the evil empire replacement of what used to be the Soviet Union. So I don't think that all of the problems that you mentioned, that we could add more of them don't go away if we just focus on one. So if China manages to win the hearts and minds of Europeans by doing something that is very high on the priority list in Europe, for example, moving away from coal, then it appears as a country that takes climate change policies so seriously that we can also trust the country in areas that are currently seen as more controversial. And even if Afghanistan is no longer high on the priority list, or to put it bluntly, we utterly failed there, and there is no appetite to go on any similar adventure anytime, adventure anytime soon, we will see growing conflicts on the Belt and Road Initiative side effects that also need something like a common denominator where we address the problems that come from conflicting interests or the principle-driven definitions of what the problem is in a certain situation. So the more we develop cooperation in all the mentioned areas, and even more, the more we find a solution that is not confrontational. Mm. I really enjoy the conversation, even though sometimes our conversation go a little bit abstract, but I think that's exactly what we need now. Not necessarily just uh, daily transactional thinking, but uh, forward-looking uh, uh, strategies and interactions. I want to thank the three of you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Nicholas uh, White and uh, um, Ulrich Bruckner, Wang Yiwei. Thank you so much. You're watching World Insight with me, Tianwei. Coming up, as China rolls out plans to achieve carbon neutrality and carbon peak, at the core of these efforts is the nation's biggest energy supplier, the State Grid Corporation. With power shortages in some part of northeastern China, it's all the more crucial to hear details of the green transition direct from the State Grid Chairman after these reminders. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too. 
by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei, go beyond the headlines. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Who powers China? The answer, quite literally, is, of course, the world's largest public utility company, the State Grid Corporation of China. It's a mega state-owned Chinese enterprise that ranks second on the Fortune Global 500 list. SGCC ensures that more than a billion Chinese can have their lights on and computers are charged. As China pledges to shift to green power, how state grid generates its electricity plays a key role in that energy transition. In March this year, SGCC released its action plan for carbon neutrality in which the company plans to transmit more clean energy between regions, install more clean power generating capacity, and focus on using innovative and cutting edge technologies to improve power grids. On these, I talked to earlier the executive chairman of SGCC, Mr. Shen Baoan. Do listen to his messages. Carbon neutral. So tell me more about how your sector is likely to implement that goal. In China, the energy sector accounts for more than 80% of the country's total carbon emissions. Therefore, to realize China's climate goals means China's energy industry must speed up transformation itself to become cleaner and more sustainable. Our industry will face a systematic and fundamental reform facing both challenges and opportunities. The challenge lies in the fact that the old energy model is no longer sustainable, so we have to remodel the entire system while securing energy supply. As one can imagine, that's a very difficult task. Moreover, the distribution of interest will also drastically change. But there are also opportunities. In the process of transition to clean energy, new business forms and models will emerge in large numbers, creating opportunities and fostering new growth drivers. If we can catch this opportunity, then our traditional energy companies will achieve a big leap in upgrading themselves. It seems that you are having the lights in your eyes talking about the new opportunities. Really want to know, you know, President Xi of China talking about using new energy for new power system in China. How does that work? Compared with traditional power systems, a new power system has four main features. Okay. The first new feature comes from the supply side. New energy has gradually become dominant in both generation and consumption. For a long time, coal, natural gas and other fossil energy covers a majority of China's energy mix. However, in the past decade, power generation of wind, solar and other new energy sources have developed remarkably in China, with a share of installed capacity rising from 5 percent to 24 percent. Meanwhile, the share of coal-fired electricity has been decreasing. In 2020, coal plants fell to a historic share of less than 50 percent. We estimate that by 2030, the installed capacity of new energy will surpass coal-fired and become the largest power source in China. By 2060, the new energy generation is expected to exceed 50 percent of total power generation in China and become the country's main source of energy supply. Now let's look at changes on the demand side, which are manifested in the high penetration of electrification and the emergence of a large number of what we call prosumers. 
什么意思呢？怎么理解啊？啊，就是。Let me explain what these mean. Electric power is a high-quality and clean secondary energy. With the construction of a power system based on new energy, the use of electricity will be further expanded and extended to many other areas that were not electrified. For example, in the field of electric vehicles, China now accounts for more than five million EVs, accounting for half of the world total, and this number is still growing at an extraordinary speed. 而且现在电动汽车的发展速度也是非常的快。再比如像居民清洁取暖。Another example is residential heating with clean energy. In North China, people used to burn wood or coal for heating. Now we are pushing hard for people to use electricity instead of coal. So now many more people are using clean energy to heat their apartments and to cook in winter. 那么同时也出现了一些新的电力用户啊，这些用户呢，既是电力的消费者。In the meantime, prosumers have emerged who are both consumers and producers of electricity. For instance, people who install PV generation systems on their roofs. When there is excess, they can sell residual electricity to the grid company, and when there is a deficit, they can buy electricity from the grid company. 还可以从电网买电，啊。EV owners are also prosumers. They can charge their vehicles during off-peak hours and sell the electricity stored in their car batteries back to the grids during peak hours. These new phenomenons will cause profound changes to the relationship between the production and selling of power. 将使电力的产销关系发生深刻的变化 Fundamental changes, almost. So that was new energy on the user side. Next is the grid system. The new energy grid structure will have large grids taking the lead, while other types of grids merge and coexist. So that means more competition. I think competition and development go hand in hand. This new layout of grid development will allow efficient development of grid and 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 grid we will strongly work to make breakthroughs in key technologies. We plan to invest $46 billion as R&D funds in the next decade to tackle key technological issues in power systems based on new energy. In addition, digital technology will be used to upgrade the grid. The state grid new energy cloud the world's largest new energy service platform is in operation. Connecting two million wind farms and PV power stations with new energy installed capacity reaching 470 gigawatts. We have also set up the world's largest smart service platform for the internet of EVs integrating over 1.3 million charging stations. Lastly, new energy means the entire mechanism of how the electricity system operates will be changed significantly. New power generation is fluctuating and random in nature. Therefore, electricity companies don't have absolute control on the supply side. This means we must work on power storage technologies and complement that with demand side policy measures. Only by coordinating power source, power grid, power load, and power storage can we achieve demand and supply balance in the new energy age. So the deep changes brought by the new energy system are most evident in these four aspects. So it seems that Mr. Xian, there are so many changing factors going on all at the same time. So what would that mean to your work in a way? How would you plan with a clear vision? After President Xi announced the 2030 and 2060 climate goals, we at once began to do research and draw up an action plan. Given our role in the industry, State Grid is determined to be a leader promoter and a pioneer in clean energy transition. So all your workers 
All your colleagues know about this. <laughs> yes, that's the goal we are all working towards. In March, we released the first carbon peak and carbon neutral action plan among energy enterprises in China. Then in July, we announced a plan to achieve major technological breakthrough. In the next five years, we plan to invest $350 billion to upgrade the entire power grid. $350 billion. Uh, it's a lot of money. So have you ever thought about it, whether it will be really worthwhile? The transformation to and development of clean energy is a great feat. So investing in this is the right thing to do. Secondly, doing major scientific research and building new grids do require funding. So as a company, we think it is very much worth the investment in terms of its financial return, its social impact, and in contributing to the development of clean energy. Mr. Xin, many are interested in China, how you are going to develop not only by yourself but also with others. So Belt and Road Initiative, how you been contributing to the Belt and Road Initiative, how many opportunities and challenges for you and your company when you are developing your projects on the Belt and Road? Energy cooperation is a key area in the Belt and Road. In recent years, we have been operating on the principle of mutual benefit and win-win cooperation to expand our international reach. We have successfully invested in and operated backbone energy networks in nine countries and regions. We have achieved a great deal in grid interconnection and international energy production cooperation. In Brazil, for example, we built two power highways with UHV technology. This project is able to transmit clean hydropower from the Amazon to load centers such as Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo some 2,000 kilometers away. These power highways have been giving a strong boost to local economic and social development and is helping Brazil's transition towards clean energy. Going forward, we will deeply participate in the Belt and Road, adhere to the principles of green development. We will strive to make more contributions to countries and regions along the Belt and Road in terms of conserving local ecology, saving energy, and reducing emission. On one hand, we will work with them to make technological breakthroughs, to solve common problems encountered in energy transition. Second, by leveraging our experience and advantages in building new energy grids, we will better serve our international peers through project development and technical consultancy. And last, throughout the whole process of our overseas investment, construction and operation, we will adhere to the principle of environmental protection. We will fulfill our corporate social responsibility and promote the harmonious coexistence of man and nature. What you just said about green, about environmental protection, how is that implemented in your Belt and Road Initiative? As SGCC is extending our services abroad, the idea is to have green and low carbon steps at the core of everything we do. From project selection to construction to management, everything has to be green in mind. Again, to use our electricity superhighway project in Brazil as an example, it's a classic case of using hydropower to develop clean and low carbon energy. 
The ultra-high voltage direct current transmission project sends electricity from hydropower stations in the Amazon region in the north to the consumption centers like southern megacities Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. The Brazilian government is pleased with it, and so are the local people. This is precisely the kind of project we would like to work on in the future. We are willing to devote our time, resources, money and people to these works. Sounds romantic, uh, the Amazon River water and for the power generation. Stay Great is one of the biggest companies in the world. And now we are facing a world with in tremendous uncertainties. Geopolitics, the pandemic, you name it. So, as someone who's leading such a company, what does that mean? How are you making your daily decisions? Indeed, the world is currently going through a historical transformation. Our operations overseas are affected by many events, not least the pandemic. To be frank, it's getting more and more challenging for us in the overseas market. But what we need to remember is that economic globalization is here to stay. This general trend will not change, and the energy transition to low carbon will not stop. It's a global consensus that we need to counter climate change. It's also every country's shared responsibility. So for us, as an enterprise, as long as we are doing our business in line with these major trends, then we will certainly be able to overcome any confusion and difficulty that's on the way. Thank you so much, Mr. Xin. What a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. My exclusive interview with Mr. Xin Bao An, the chairman of SGCC, China's State Grid Corporation. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Insight, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.